Hi, Ezra. Hello. Um, so I titled this event, How Does Politics Work? And um, you, well, you can see Phil in the chat and also on Twitter, a bunch of people responded like, it doesn't. And I thought to myself, if I had been doing an event like, how does the mafia work? And I brought in an expert on the mafia, I think people would be less inclined to say it doesn't. Why are people so inclined to think the politics doesn't work? So uh, first, thank you for having me. Also, I think I might have just gotten blurry on my camera, and I'm not sure why. So hopefully that's going to fix if I do that a couple times, but it doesn't <laughs> yeah, actually seem to be. Uh, we'll see if it uh, repairs. OK, so I think that if you said, if you titled an event, which I would 100% come to, how does the mafia work? What people would understand they're getting is insight into the organizational structure and logic of the mafia. They would not implicitly understand how does a mafia promote the common good in a relatively representative and accountable fashion. But when you say, how does American politics work? What is, what is lurking behind the word work is a value judgment of what it means for it to work. Uh, my book, Why We're Polarized, is, I would say, uh, a, I, I hope a good book, but it's a book about how American politics functions at the same time that it is maybe a book about why it doesn't work. Because like many other people, I think American politics, uh, the, the goal, the point of it is to solve problems in a representative and thoughtful and accountable way. And I think that it has been doing that less and less well um, in, in recent decades. Uh, but but I think that's what's happening there. I think that people are they, they're not happy with the performance of government. So they're saying it, it doesn't work, not that it doesn't have an internal logic or structure. It, your book takes a kind of systemic perspective, as you say, which is like the oh, hold on. Well, yeah, I don't know what just happened there. OK, uh, but now you're less blurry. I, I tried to toggle my HD video. It seems to have fixed the problem. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so you take a systemic perspective. And you talk about um, there's a kind of um, um, vicious cycle of polarization um, to appeal to a more polarized public, political institutions and political actors behave more polarized. And as they do that, they, they polarize the public. And it struck me that this sort of systemic perspective, which is along the lines of the how does mafia work approach, uh -huh. right? Um, it reminded me of like what it, it, as though polarization is like this. Um, sort of emergent order, or you could call it a disorder that shows up kind of like the way markets produce an emergent order, like a spontaneous order, right? Polarization is in a way a kind of spontaneous order that seems like it's getting produced. No one is intentionally producing it. There's no central planner um, producing polarization, right? It's kind of emerging out of politics. Um, does that seem right to you? And does it, does it, is it a, is it an emergent disorder? I don't think it's an emergent disorder. Um, uh, let me start there. I don't think the market analogy is a bad one because what I'm talking about in that excerpt and also throughout the book is so what's happening in a market, right? You have producers of something or another, producers of goods or service who are competing for market share, right? They're competing for the share of potential customers that they can absorb. What happens in a small d-ish, small d on the margin, democratic system. You have political actors competing for market share. Now they do so just like people do in a market within certain constraints. I mean, if I make cars, I'm not really expecting to get the market share of people who make cotton candy, but never, you know, and there are laws and rules and, you know, so on. Um, I can't like make my cars, but also hand out like a free bag of heroin with every car, you know, like there are things you can't do. But the reason you have polarization is a natural phenomenon in party systems is that in order to both attain market share and achieve goals, you have to be differentiated in politics. Uh, one of the things I talk about in, in some ways, the, the emergent disorder is much more the pre-polarized equilibrium that we had in mid 20th century American politics, which internationally was very, very weird. And actually even in our history to some degree was weird, but where we had political parties without much ideological differentiation which is really what I'm saying there is that we had political part, a two party system that was in fact a four party system. And you could even probably split it down into more sub parties than this, but you fundamentally had the Democrats as we more or less think of them today, right? Liberal Democrats, New Deal Democrats. You had the Dixiecrats, like the Southern racist authoritarian bloc. You had Northern liberal Republican party. Um, so, you know, your George Romney's, your John Lindsay's, 
you know, and then you had the more conservative Republican Party centered in the West, like your Barry Goldwaters, your Ronald Reagans. And because you had um, conservatives in the Democratic Party, liberals in the Republican Party, it was actually very confusing what it meant to vote for a Democrat or Republican. So if you were voting for a Democratic Senate candidate in Massachusetts, you were, you know, in 1952, you were probably voting for a liberal. And um, but you were voting to give power to a Senate Democratic majority that was heavily controlled by conservative Southern Democrats. So in, in many cases, and you know, there's this famous APSA report from 1950, you know, towards a responsible two-party system that argues probably correctly the problem in American politics in that period is, is not enough polarization because they were saying that the fundamental choice you have in American politics as a voter is which party to vote for. And if the party you vote for doesn't honor that vote, by presenting you an agenda that is different than the other party, they're not giving you, in, in effect, a real way to you know, keep your hand on the rudder of American politics. Now, what I would say is a, a disorder in American politics is that party polarization is natural and we have a political system, an institutional structure that does not work well under conditions of party polarization. But to me, the polarization is much more natural than say, the filibuster, the structure of the U.S. Senate, the high number of veto points, like all these, the electoral college, all these weird things we have that make it very hard to do anything under polarized conditions in American politics. The idea that parties are going to represent different ideas and demographics, I mean, that's just how, I mean, that's just politics. You might think it's a little, there's somewhere in your book, someone says like, it's, it's unfair to voters if they have an yeah. incoherent choice, right? Right. Um, Let's pause for a second uh, and say hi. Hi, everyone. This is Night Owls. Uh, I'm Agnes Callard. Um, Ezra, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Ezra Klein. I'm a columnist at the New York Times. I'm host of the podcast, The Ezra Klein Show. You're catching me, I will. I want to say, in a weird mood because uh, I was telling Agnes this beforehand, and it, we can talk about this too, but um, I'm reporting out a story on American politics and our policy towards Afghanistan. It's one of the grimmest things I've ever reported. And also speaks to ways that American politics maybe like gets trapped in insane bureaucratic designs of its own mm -hmm. construction. And then people take these functional institutional fictions as true like constraints. Status quo bias is very powerful, but we are possibly going to cause a mass starvation or at least contribute to one in a way that is very uh, hard to quickly put down once you begin to get a sense of the scope of it. So um, I'm not as lighthearted as maybe I would be on another night. Uh, but anyway, that's what I do. Great. Um, Tyler, do you want to come up and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tyler Zimmer. I teach philosophy at UChicago. I'm one of Agnes's colleagues. I'll also be helping to run the Q&A, helping to facilitate it, which will happen later in the event. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we have this little ask a question box at the bottom. Um, so if you have a question throughout the event, you can just sort of click that box and you know ask your question. And then later I'll go through and and choose from among the best questions in terms of picking folks to come up. So I look forward to that. And I forgot to say who I am. I'm, uh, I mean, I, I gave you my name, but I uh, teach philosophy at the University of Chicago. And uh, what we're gonna do is like, Ezra and I will talk for maybe another 40, 50 minutes and then we'll have the Q and A. So, and put your questions in the ask a question box rather than in the chat, okay? Um, uh, and please do come up uh, and ask them. You only have to be on screen for like a minute or two. I know it's sort of self-conscious and hard, but it's way more fun for everyone if you actually come up and ask your question. Um, and I'll uh, just say, don't feel you can only ask me about American politics. I talk about American politics all the time. I'm excited to be here with all you philosophers. Uh, you can can ask weird stuff. Agnes gives good answers to weird questions. I've learned from experience, <laughs> so it can it can be doesn't all have to be the the diverse R stuff. Okay, so when I was, um, uh, oh, actually, let me ask this question first. Uh, something I, I learned so many things from your book. I'm extremely ignorant about politics. So for me, the like differential between how much I know now versus before reading, it's huge. Uh, I suspect like a lot of people who read it probably knew a lot of the stuff. But so for me, it was, it was very educational. Um, so one thing that I learned that I was surprised by is the degree to which currently density predicts political partisanship. So, uh, uh, here's a statistic you give. House Democrats represent 78% of Whole Foods District and 27% of Cracker Barrels, right, in their district. Um, 
So, and um, the sort of explanation you give for this is that our psychology sort of match our politics better than they used to. So there's a kind of pro psychological profile for a Democrat as being maybe say more open to experience and change and for Republican as maybe being higher in conscientiousness. And those things are in turn gonna be correlated with like whether you wanna live in a big house or a small house near the people or not. And um, uh, I wonder, um, whether that sorting of, of uh, uh, people by temperament, political sorting of people by temperament, is that gonna make politics less heritable? Because it seems to me that temperament is not that heritable. That is like my kids, like some of them, their temperament is really similar to me, some of their temperament is really different from me. Um, so I, I guess I would predict that the sorting of politics by temperament would, de would push against the sorting of politics by inheritance. So I think I wouldn't, fully buy in to the move you made there from there being uh, correlated traits with living in a city, all the way to sort of temperament being the way to understand what is happening in those traits, mm. right? Like that one of my kids is an introvert and the other is an extra, like the temperament right. I think is a little bit different than, here's my, um, but, but let me talk about this for a little bit. So Will Wilkinson has done great work on this. He is uh, back when he was in his Canaan before the, before the troubles. Uh, he had a big report um, called the density divide. And what the report shows is that over the past hundred years, like if you go back to 1916, there is no real correlation between the density of an area and whether it votes for Democrats or Republicans, which again makes sense because the parties were highly ideologically diffuse. Now there is not one density in, in America, not one that votes Republican, not one density in America and um, rural areas are, are quite heavily Republican. So we've developed a very, very sharp urban geographic or urban rural split in, in American politics, which is not unknown. I mean, you know, urban uh, rural splits are pretty standard across the world, but 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 ours is pretty bad. So then you get into well, why? Like, what is it about living in a city that would make you at this point democratic? Um, and, and why wasn't it that way fifty years ago? Uh, and I think there are a couple things, but basically, I'm trying to think about how to explain this. So. One of the things Will is getting at in that report that I pick up a little bit from there is that there are, the question of why somebody moves to a city at one point in American life might've just been, might've been pretty economically driven, right? You move to a city because a family can't feed y'all on the farm and there's textile manufacturing. That's not really why people move to San Francisco now. Uh, like they want to work at Google or something, but, but they have a lot of choice. Like if you're somebody who can work at Google, like you could also do a lot of things. And so there's, and then also as the parties have become much more differentiated across uh, an array of characteristics, not just ideology, but just like how multi-ethnic they are, you know, their sort of foreign policy leanings towards internationalism, a set of traits around cosmopolitanism, you know, traditionalism, et cetera, have begun being very predictive. They're part of our kind of polarization mix. So from here, we're getting into territory that it has a funny like ontological status for me because I think this is a place where we are getting at something really important that we do not know how to measure and we don't know quite how we're getting at it. So there's any number of books at this point um, about the psychology of partisanship. There's a huge number of unusual psychological correlates of partisanship. Your disgust response helps predict your partisanship. Whether you like spicy food, um, whether you like avant-garde art, is very heavily related to your partisanship. Like I can show you paintings, and depending on which paintings you like, have a pretty good guess of who you're going to vote for. And of course, it makes sense that our politics would be related to fundamental things in our outlook of the world, our personality. Um, you know, among like just think of it on a, a kind of traditionalism versus, uh, you know non-traditionalism uh, access, right? If you're somebody who is intuitively more comfortable staying at home, staying in the city you grew up in, you know, being in the religious community that, that your family's in, et cetera, um, versus you're somebody who is sort of driven to, to go further, go out, explore. Like those are gonna be pretty different things. And then the uh, party that represents more like traditional religion, more traditional family structures, more like, places people traditionally lived is going to be more appealing to you and, and vice versa on the other side. So I think the psychological stuff here is important, but I am at the same time, I used a lot less of that research in the book 
than I might have, and in some ways than I wanted to, because I don't think the research is very good. I don't think they know what they're measuring. I think the the measuring skills they have are incredibly crude. They're basically throwing darts at correlations and trying to make up stories that make some sense. You know, they can't run very good randomized experiments on this stuff. And so something, given like the the vast size of that literature that has now emerged, something is happening there. But what it is, what we are saying when we say like something, you know, psychology is helping to drive your partisanship and also the parties are increasingly appealing to it on both sides. It's a little tricky um, uh, to, to ground this example a little bit. People may or may not remember there's a famous political ad in 03 back when Howard Dean was looked like the front runner for the Democratic um, candidacy and uh, Democratic uh, nomination. And the, the structure of the ad is like, it's such a wonderful can I screen share in this? I can, right? I don't know the answer to that. I you don't can, think you because can. I could see it right here. Can. Okay. Can I just pull Go this ahead. up? Because I think it's It'll a great, a um, uh, I think it's just, you know, it all, uh, let me just see if I can do this. Um, because if I could find it, you'd really see what I'm talking about by then if I just tell it to you. Yeah. Okay. Here I is. remember it from your book, but I, I don't remember it from yeah. your life. So I haven't seen it. Okay. So let me see what will happen if I screen share. Um, Chrome tab, break. Okay. Let's what see do if you guys think of Howard Dean's plan? Raise taxes on families by nineteen hundred dollars a year. What do I think? Well, I think Howard Dean should take his tax hiking, government expanding, latte drinking, sushi eating, Volvo driving, New York Times reading, body piercing. Hollywood loving left wing freak show back to Vermont where it belongs. <laughs> All right. So, y'all heard that. So, what happened in that ad? It's like a great question. Like an almost Rosetta Stone, you might say, to American politics. And that's still, that's, that's old now. They start with two things that are political, right? I, I think it's like government expanding, tax hiking. Sure enough, Howard Dean wanted big government. He wanted the higher taxes. Those are traditionally like po like political cleavages. And then it just goes off the rails, right? Body, Body piercing. piercing, sushi eating, latte drinking, Hollywood, the New York Times, like all these things that are not actually obviously political. Like what what, what does your politics have to do with whether you enjoy raw fish? Like how long you cook fish for? Um, what like lattes? Why, why would latte, like milk in coffee? Like what's the issue here? Just because you steam it, would a cafe au lait be different? And look at who say it. it's like these two older white, you know, farmers, like they're somewhere cold. There's a lot going on in there, which is to say that there are a lot of correlates in there of lifestyle choice that are not obviously political, but that were well understood to somehow reflect our politics. I don't think they're positing in that ad a causal relationship with like, first you like Howard Dean, this 40 something year old nerd governor of Vermont, and then you want a tongue piercing, right? It goes the other way. Like first you have a tongue piercing and that makes you more likely to like Howard Dean, but why? Like Howard Dean doesn't have a tongue piercing. He doesn't, he's not like promoting lower taxes on body piercers. Like it's again, it's not like you like Howard Dean and then you develop a, a taste for cappuccino. It's you like cappuccino, so maybe you might also enjoy Howard Dean. And so again, if you had to explain the why of this ad, it would be hard to do, and I cannot do it. But there is something here, and that something here cross correlates to politics. It's very clear in that ad, those people don't live in a big city, right? Like you, you just know from the setting and everything, so it cross correlates to where you live. And like, this is the thing. The fact that we are divided by cities and rural areas is somehow similar to the fact that we're divided by Whole Foods and Cracker Barrels, and is also somehow similar to the fact that we're divided in which television shows we watch, and is also somehow like reflecting the music we listen to, country versus hip hop, let's, let's say as an example, and it's all there. And the parties in completely weird ways are getting better and better and better at appealing across this entire spectrum of lifestyle preference, even when what they're appealing on is not a policy issue or what we'd even understand as a political question. And it's like, that is part of our polarization now too. And we're just getting better at that as the parties become clearer and thus more capable of, of making these more subtle appeals. 
It's like, that's where we are. And it's weird, but something is important that we just don't really know how to measure it. So I, when I was, you know, when I was reading your book and I, I was very struck by this kind of um, this organization that's coming in, right, where all these different dimensions are starting to line up so that there is an identity on either side, you know, in all these different parts of life. And I was thinking, why is this happening? I had two two theories or two ideas about it. OK, the first one is just less war. Um, so, um, you know, we've had like, you know, since, I don't know, earlier in the 20th century, we've just had less war and the wars that we've had have been less and less of a um, uh, uh, source of identity, right? So the Vietnam War is gonna be less of a source of identity than World War II, Gulf War, uh, Afghanistan War, less of a source of identity than Vietnam. Um, and um, there's a quote in your, there's, a, there's a, a thing you say in your book, which is that civil war is 12 times less probable in societies where ethnicity is cross cut by socioeconomic class, uh, region and religion. And so if you think of the lining up of all of these differences on two different, you know, into two different poles as kind of like a version of civil, like a cold civil war, a gentle civil war, right? We're kind of fighting a war and we're, we're organizing ourselves in a kind of militaristic formation where we have these two identities and we're opposed to one another. And one reason why you might think we would do that is we really like war and we like fighting and we like being against someone, but we haven't had a lot of that. And so we've created it internally. I need to think about this for a bit. I don't think that holds as a theory of polarization, in part because you have high levels of polarization, one at different place uh, at different points in, in different countries that are, they do have a lot of war. Um, also not clear to me that if we had a high war, like war at the beginning has a rally around the flag effect, but it also can lead to big party schisms and, and a lot of mm. infighting. I mean, look at the Iraq war, which I think what you're, if we were trying to run predictions based off of your theory, I think we would say, well, wars will come with in some way proportionate to their size a reduction in polarization in the system but i think you would say looking at our system that the iraq war left it significantly more polarized i think there's no doubt that the vietnam war left it more polarized um and and so on and so forth that's one version of it what I do think is a, a ver, uh, another version of that theory that I'm probably a little bit more friendly to is unifying for an enemy, not quite war. So I do mm -hmm. think that the that the Axis powers and then later, and actually probably more uh, usefully, the Soviet Union were ex an externally unifying force on American politics that suppressed some of our differences and like pushed on the margin against a certain amount of domestic polarization. I don't know how much in their absence, we've not really, but we've like looked for, but have not found another unifying foreign enemy, uh, foreign enemy, <laughs> enemy. Um, you know, we wanted to create a clash of civilizations with Islam for a while. That didn't really pan out. It, you know, it turned out that Al Qaeda couldn't stand in for all of Islam. And it didn't really make sense to have the most powerful country the world has ever known, like in a like mono mono battle with, you know, a bunch of terrorists in the desert. Uh, there's obviously some effort to make China the new unifying enemy. We will see where that goes. I think that actually has potential to be like both effective and very, very dangerous for the future of humanity. But I do think in the absence of unifying enemy, we turn to each other. Now that said, um, again, I think though that this is basing a little bit off of an aberrational period in mid-century American politics. I think what mm -hmm. you're doing sort of implicitly, Agnes, is saying, well, the natural state is to be a lot less polarized than we are now. And sort of like in the memory, like in the part of American politics we remember, because it's a part that, you know, you were closer to when you grew up in and your parents were in and your grandparents were in, um, we weren't quite as polarized. Like what was going on then? Well, we had these big world wars and that's a big part of our mythology of that time. But those wars happened when America had very unusually highly non-polarized parties. And that was a legacy of the civil war in this country. Uh, like just full stop. Like America's like long period of depolarization is a function of race. And it's particularly a function of the civil war. You were not gonna have a democratic 
Repub uh, I'm sorry, you're not going to have a Republican South for a long time because the Republican Party invaded the South. And so I think that the, um, you know, I think you can tell a very clean story about how, and, and this is empirically backed up, how race is a central, like, depolarizing player and the central sort of blockage to the party's polarizing in a natural way. It takes time for that blockage to work itself out of the American political system. And then once it does, there's just an acceleration of polarization that is just continuing on until today. I don't think war fits the story well, is basically what I'm saying. Um, so I've noticed that some, but not all, political discussions gravitate towards intractable metaphysical or linguistic problems in a super weird way. Like the abortion dispute, right, gravitates towards this problem of like, what is a human being and when, like, when does a human being come into existence? And it's like, you know, it's weird just because like in one, in one, there are certain kinds of instances intuitions that I think everyone, sh like almost everyone shares, like that, for instance, an abortion at 39 weeks is far more morally serious than an abortion at five weeks. Like, I, I think almost mm -hmm. everyone would agree with that. But like that view itself is kind of actually inconsistent with the metaphysics behind either position, right, which says like, well, there's no, you know, there's maybe there's no human being until this exact point, right? Um, that it, th there's a there's a there's a continuous intuition there that is difficult to square with um, the being has to be exist outside or not, right? Um, uh, there's a similar kind of issue with like way back when we were worried about whether being gay was a choice. Like that was a big thing, right? Is being gay a choice? And I, I just mm -hmm. remember puzzling over that of like, well, if it's not a problem, then why does it matter whether it's a choice? And if, you know, clearly like being in gay relationships is a choice. So why would it matter whether being gay was a choice, right? But there was this metaphysical problem that people wanted to argue about, right? Um, the definition of marriage, like the idea whether marriage is somehow defined as between being a man and a woman, is that, is that the essence or the definition of marriage? Um, trans debates now go into the metaphysical direction, like what is a woman? Um, uh, but like a lot of debates don't go in that direction. Like I think the environment, not really. Though recently Jordan Peterson was on Joe Rogan and he had this like, he did this thing where he's like, what is climate? In some way, climate is everything. And it was this metaphysical, I'm like, uh oh, he's moving climate into metaphysics. Um, uh, this is uh, old, though. There was a very famous ad from the the CEI, the Senate Committee, and it's a right wing organization. Mm -hmm. like, it's like, it's like, what is carbon? Carbon yeah. dioxide is life, <laughs> which like it is, you know, right, right. it's not wrong exactly, but it's just dumb. Um, right. As is that it sounds like, but I didn't see the. I did not have four and a half hours to give Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson <laughs> I, that particular conversation, I that, I so I can't say I someone. probably shouldn't comment on it. I was explaining to someone and they were, and they told me this thing from Joe Rogan. So, um, uh, um, but yeah, so like, like, um, the, the, you know, I don't know, debates over taxation don't tend to get metaphysical. So it's, it's like some, some debates get metaphysical. Most don't. Um, and I wonder why this happens. Like, you know, one obvious theory would be that, um, we don't want the debate to be resolved. We want to make sure that it isn't resolved. We want to keep arguing about this because the debate exists in order to organize people into camps. And so we can't let it depend on something empirical that could then just be resolved. Do you think that the increase in polarization sort of pushes us in the direction of this kind of um, move towards metaphysics? Oh, see, I sort of think the opposite. I think that we're constantly trying to push debates into empirical ground that they can't really mm. hold as if there's some empirical solution to what are fundamentally values or intuitive differences. And in fact, I think that's true for most of the examples you just gave. Like, there was a, I remember the fight over marriage, right? I, I, I was around for that one. And it's just this constant effort to try to prove I mean, there's a lot of attention to studies about what would happen to a kid raised in the same sex household. And there are these insane bank shot arguments about, I mean, very famously, I think it's Rick Santorum, but I could be wrong. It's like, if you can marry men, can you marry a box turtle? And like, that was like a big, you know, well, what happens next, right? Like an empirical view that if you do this, well, then, you know, you'll have polyamorous marriage. And then like the polyamorous people are like, yeah, that'd be, that'd be fine. <laughs> and then it's like, well, then you can marry a dog. And it's like, no, there's a difference in the dog. A dog can't consent, you know. Um, I think actually that abortion is a little bit of a, a specific case, which maybe we can, we can come back to. 
because I, I also don't really, I, I don't think people genuinely do have a consistent view on that. I think everybody, most human beings believe there's some kind of continuum of, of like moral, like question there. And they just, nobody knows, like honest people don't know where to put the line, right? You know, is it like, because there is nowhere to put it, right? At some point you're always making a judgment call. Um, but the rest of them, I think actually the, the lie of politics often, I say this as a policy guy, is that there is some piece of empirical data that will decide the issue. And that in the counterfactual world where you could prove it, like to your point about a fight over whether or not, you know, being gay was a choice. Let's say that like the next day in 1997, when this is going on, like somebody came out with a study and the study was just like bulletproof. And it's like, we found the gay gene. It's like, how many minds would that have actually changed? I think not that many, because what most people in that debate on the right side of not the, what most people on the anti-gay side of that debate were saying was like, I find this gross. Like sort of similarly, if you could find the bestiality gene, like nobody nobody cares, like you can't marry, you don't get to fuck dogs. Like that's like not, we're not doing that, you know, right now. Um, we'll see what happens in the future. But <laughs> I think there's a desire to make political problems soluble and to make them soluble through empirics when normally the empirics are uh, like window dressing. A different example than the ones you gave, but where I think you see it really clearly is a fight over immigration and wages. I think the fight over immigration and wages is 96% bullshit. And we end up in this insane, like how many George Borjas analyses can dance on the head of a pin. And it's like, at this point, we're down to noting that like a lot of Borjas says he's this anti-immigration Harvard economist. A lot of his results are like based on like a 13 or 17 person subgroup of non-college white men from Miami in this one period. And it's like, it's completely insane because nobody actually cares. Like the immigration fight is over whether or not people feel comfortable with this, with their country letting in more immigrants, particularly from, from Latin and, and, and Central America and South America. And it's like, if you could prove the wage thing one way or another, it wouldn't change anything because it's not really what they're fighting about. But it is safe ground to try to move it on to empirics, like as if you could somehow decide it. And so people do it all the time. So yeah, I think it's um I think in some ways that it would be better if we admitted that American politics is more metaphysical and more value-laden than we like to do. I mean, COVID has been another ongoing example of this. Like the science cannot tell you what your beliefs about risk are. The science cannot tell you like what your values are about the risk you're willing to pose to another person. Like there's not like a science answer, like it can't resolve the question, but we wish it could because then maybe we wouldn't have to fight about it. Or maybe if we think it would resolve it on our side, then everybody else would have to shut up and admit we're right about it. See, part of what is moving me to think about these cases where we get these like um, very po polarized conversations, it's actually conversation, certainly philosophical conversation, is a place where polarization is good, right? So if I'm giving a talk, a philosophy talk, what I want is for everyone in the room to just try to make themselves the opposite of my position, to try to see why I'm wrong. Um, and like, if you want, you know, you, you're, you're watching two people talk, it often just going to be really interesting if they disagree. It's, it's, it's going to be most interesting if one of the people just makes themselves into the opposite of the other person. Like not even that they naturally disagree, but they unnaturally, they create a disagreement. And so polarization is great for, I think it's great for conversation. It's not great for action. You have a quote in your book where you talk to the mayor of LA uh, and you asked him how he dealt with identity politics. And he said, talk less, act more, right? And uh, what if we want to talk more and act less, right? Then we would have more, like you think polarization, this, so this was my other thesis. Like one is we kind of like war and that's the negative version. We're more polarized because we like adverse, some kind of adversarial uh, stance to be incorporated into our everyday life. And the more optimistic one is we like to talk. Um, and we, you know, you, you do describe in your book the ways in which the system is becoming sort of more stable. Like there's a lot of stasis. There's a lot of difficulty in getting anything done, which is like stasis, right? Um, you just mentioned status quo bias and like um, just that that our, our political world seems very sticky. It seems very hard to get things done. 
right? That should go along with, we're mostly interested in having conversations and not achieving anything. So a couple of thoughts. So one, and please don't take this the wrong way, but, but you're, but you're a very unusual person <laughs> <laughs> and most people hate conflict. They do not want other people to turn themselves into the antithesis of their position in conversation. <laughs> the reason people complain now about seeing their relatives on Thanksgiving and having to argue politics is they hate arguing politics and they've arranged their lives to functionally never do it. And you just like kind of can't do that with family exactly. Like Uncle Bob is still there and like watches a lot of Fox News. Um, so I, I actually think it, it's really easy to underestimate how much we just loathe conflict. And and by the way, there's a lot of political science research on this. Um, people, there's a great book called Stealth Democracy and its fundamental thesis backed up by a bunch of polling is that people have very weak views on policy. The thing they have strong views on is that people shouldn't be fighting about it. And the more fighting they see in politics, the more they basically associationally come to oppose the policy because they assume that fighting means it has to be bad. Otherwise, why would everybody be fighting so much? Um, and so conflict is a kind of, it's like a, or it, it's like an independent generator of bad feelings about American politics, sort of no matter the merits of the cause or the outcome. So, um, so that's one thing. Uh, and then, but on a different level, I sort of think you're right. I don't think we should, and this is a big theme of the book, as you know, I don't think we should see polarization as intrinsically a bad thing at all. I think it's totally fine. Um, and I think oftentimes it would be healthy. I wrote a piece, uh, it has a weird headline. It's like a hundred days of radical change or something. It's a hundred day piece on the Biden administration. But the point of that piece is that we shouldn't abstractly prize compromised or consensus oriented outcomes. In fact, we should think it a perfectly natural way for a system to work that one party gets power, like does a very pure version of their thing and then they eventually lose and the other party does it. And like, you go back and forth with like, you know, instead of like trying to meet in the middle, you let the extremes or not the extremes, but the, the sides, the factions govern. So, but yeah, I, I think it's a real, I think it's underestimated just like how much a problem in American politics or, or one of the problems with how people uh, read American politics is that we have a system that both does not do well under conditions of conflict but also people hate conflict and so it makes them very upset at the system and continues to like create bad feelings and undermine trust in government yeah it's interesting because there is a thing that people clearly like which is like belonging to a group and having that their group identity partly be defined by the group that is on the outside of that group, right? And you cite this mm -hmm. really interesting research about these boys who were had to give out money and like they gave it out on the basis of the flimsiest um, group identity. Um, and you could think of that as a kind of conflict, right? Um, that is, they are in, they're setting up an adversarial organization, right? But I think you're right that that's like they they like that up to a point, and then. And then there's a point at which it's no longer attractive. How do you how how do we draw that line of people enjoy being in groups and they enjoy opposing the other group on the one hand and they hate conflict? It's just they hate one on one conflict, but they like group conflict. You ever seen? Do you do you have a dog? No. You ever well? So you probably wouldn't have seen this, but there among dog owners, there's a beloved comic, and um, it just has this dog saying, "No take, only throw." I just wouldn't overestimate how much um, people have a consistent sense of like their means and their ends. This is a, a huge disagreement I have with people like Robin Hanson and some others um, who have a tendency to see people pursuing ends inconsistently or ineffectively and assume it reveals some kind of insincerity about the end. Um, I don't agree with that at all. So your point about people love being in groups, but they don't like conflict. Like, and that, like, isn't that a little bit weird? But like, maybe it isn't weird, right? They think everybody should be in their group. Um, uh, that they think their group has a, like, is like the true group and they don't see it as a group. They just see it as like what you would be. In some ways, I think this makes a lot more sense. Um, not even more sense. I think one way to think about this is to think about everything as a little bit like religion or a little bit like sports. So on sports, the stakes are nothing. 
Like <laughs> what happens if you win is nothing. And also what happens if you lose is nothing. And the point of the whole thing is nothing. And the people playing the game don't care about you. And even though the team is named after your city, it will leave if you don't fund a new stadium for them. And even though you're wearing a jersey with a player's name on it, they will leave if you don't pay them enough. Like the whole thing is completely crazy from the outside. And people just choose to be in these groups and then get really, 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 really upset or happy based on the outcomes, right? It's a complete artificial love of like group and conflict. Um, completely unmoored from any kind of real world stakes. And so you can just see how natural this is in like the human, the, the, the human mindset. And then like, I, but then I think like you can take religion as the alternative, right? And so I think the question is like, are you looking at something more like sports or more like religion? Because in religion, I mean, as somebody who's, sec who's more secular, I often look at and think about religion in terms of a bunch of different groups, right? Like Protestants and Catholics and Jews and you know, so on. Um, but if you really believe, then on some level, like the point is that everybody else should believe what you believe too. And that's particularly true in some of the more evangelical contexts. And so there's a lot of group conflict, but you don't want there to be group conflict. You want everybody to agree with you because otherwise they're all going to go to hell or, you know, the world won't be saved or whatever the, 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 set, of the, the set of outcomes um, uh, specified within your, within your holy text might be. And so I think a lot of it is like that too. We are just very tuned to be in groups, but I don't think we are very thoughtful about what it means to be in groups. And I think it's just kind of being, being human. How much of online anger do you think is real? What I mean is if you put a heart rate monitor on people, like I think of if, if you're really angry, your heart rate's going to go up, right? And like, so there's a lot of anger, like on Twitter, or whatever, on social media. And I have a really hard time telling, like, are these people actually angry? Like if I put a heart rate monitor on them, are their heart rate be increased? Or is, is, it, is it just more of like a pretense of anger? What do you think? I think mostly people are angry in the moment they're feeling angry. It might be pretty passing, but, mm. and look, there are people who are trolls and who just kind of enjoy being in the fight online. But I think, I mean, I have a fair amount of exposure to this, just like in, you know, I have a fair amount of exposure shifting between my online and real world persona. And I do think people's, experiences are pretty sincere and to some degree even a little bit overly sincere like there was a, a, a pretty interesting new york times piece the other day i think it was in portland but it's basically about like the rise of climate oriented therapy in portland or seattle like oh, yeah. all these people who have like like read so much about climate change that they're that they're going to, to, to therapists and being like I, I just like don't know how to live in this world that is burning and and they're like they're really sincere you know like i think they've slightly misread the state of the science there. But I think you see this stuff really does get to people. I mean, my mom is a big, oh, I'm not going to put this on Amy. I, I have many family members, not just her. <laughs> who are like, you know, big cable news watchers of one side or the other. And they, it's it really works them up. I mean, I think fundamentally what's happening with cable news for a lot of people is cable news is very good at attaching to your and, and weaponizing and manipulating your anxiety, your anger, your outrage, your sense of moral identity, your sense of cultural identity. And certainly my experience of how people act in that moment is like, they mean it, they feel it. Doesn't mean it'd be consistent if you put them into a situation where they would have to act on those feelings with other people, then other things might take charge. But, but, it, but in the moment, I think people are at the very least experiencing uh, a very convincing personal model of the feeling that is being pulled out of them. I guess that makes sense. Maybe the reason I'm incredulous is, you know, I like I remember this time you describe in your book how you were always interested in politics, like going back to, you know, a young teenager or whatever. And I remember as a teenager watching around me as political identities developed. And it seemed like a magic, like that somehow people just somehow knew the answers to these questions and they knew what they were. And it just never happened to me. And I kind of waited. I'm like, maybe I'm like a late bloomer and I'm going to suddenly know the answers too. Um, because it seems like, you know, you, in some sense, you, part of what it is to be interested and involved is like to, 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 like you say, to be interested in politics is to choose a side. How could it be otherwise? You say that in your book. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'd love to choose a side. I just, I don't know which side to be on. Right. 
And so for me that I have this kind of alienated experience and so maybe I'm un unusually skeptical where I'm like, I think they're, they can't really be that angry. Um, but I think maybe it's just, I'm not getting access to that same thing that would give you. This is how I feel about sports. Mm -hmm. This is a hundred percent how I feel about sports. I, I, it is the most fundamental human experience around me that I can in no way emotionally access like zero. And I, by the way, like I was an athlete, like I played football, I was a wrestler. Like I really care about playing these things. And I, like, I, I'm a competitive person. I enjoy like the, like the physical nature of the games. Like I can, I can appreciate highlights. It's not that I don't think mm. they're amazing. I love, I love sports journalism, sports stories. I love watching the last dance, but the idea that I would feel a personal connection to the 49ers because I live in San Francisco. It is, I, I, I like, I, I, I cannot like, and I, I can't even emotionally access what it would be like to feel that way, uh, which is weird because I think usually I'm pretty empathic and can emotionally access most experiences, just not sports. Um, while we're talking, I'm going to get more headphones from the other room because mine are uh, running a little bit low on batteries, but I'm listening. Okay, no problem. Um, um, I, so one way that you had of describing the divide between the left and the right um, that I thought was really interesting was that like in some way um, there it's like they've adopted a different kind of like game theoretic solution to this problem of identity. So the left has adopted this solution where it's going to collect, it's going to capture a lot of people, capture more people by collecting like a bunch of different identities, but it's not going to be that much of a unity. Right. Um, um, so the Democrats are more diverse, whereas um, mm -hmm. Republicans, there's more uh, homogeneity, right? Um, and so there's more of a coherent identity, right? But there's going to be less people, right? Um, and I guess I just wonder in the, is there, can we, ha do we have anything to say in the abstract about these two um, strategies for um, winning at the game of identity politics? These two almost opposed strategies. I don't think I have anything to say. I mean, in the abstract about them morally, about them like kind of agentially or about them strategically. I mean, strategically, like if, you know, your view seems to be like, and I hadn't really gotten this from your book, but that in some way polarization is the natural state and there were things in the way, right? And we tend mm -hmm. to, and it does make sense to me, like as you let people have more mobility, more choice, more freedom, they organize in these ways. But it looks like they organize in two different ways, right? One mm -hmm. is this kind of homogenous organization and the other is this kind of umbrella tolerance, but very little coherence organization. So that, so that I think is actually, um, oh, I have a lot of thoughts on this. So one is that I think it's much more contingent than that makes it sound. Mm. Uh, the trickiest thing about talking about polarization is that it happens on many, many, many dimensions, but in any given time, it's not happening on all dimensions. Mm -hmm. And some dimensions are emphasized and some aren't. So, I mean, you could really imagine, and we've had it other times, a much more class polarized society and a much less racially polarized society. So like strategically, that would be another potential way it could go um, and, and has gone and may go again in the future. We could have like more, we actually have a fair amount of religious polarization right now, but you could have more that could be more emphasized. Uh, in a lot of ways, racial polarization in American politics was suppressed up until Barack Obama. Hmm. Like George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, you know, George H. W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, like they all in their own ways, I mean, they all manipulated a little bit on the margins, but nobody wanted to emphasize it as like a cleavage they wanted to like really deepen. Uh, you know, people will argue about Ronald Reagan a little bit here, but compared to what had happened before him in American politics, the whole point of like, if you believe he was doing a lot of dog whistles, the point of doing dog whistles is you're not just whistling, right? He like, that, that's why you call it mm -hmm. a dog whistle because you're trying mm -hmm. to make it hard to hear. Yeah. So the total explosion of the, um, or, or the deepening, the, the amplification of the like what you might call like the multicultural cleavage in American life, like the social justice cleavage, the woke cleavage. It's pretty recent. I mean, it, 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 it builds on long time trends, long time trends in demographics and all these different things. And I think it reflects them. And that way I think it's basically inevitable. 
but it is also recent. I mean, it's Barack Obama and Donald Trump period. Uh, and, you know, and, and now we're still in a, uh, to some degree with Joe Biden, although there was also a reduction in racial polarization in the 2020 election that we can talk about why that was or wasn't. Uh, so that's one thing I would say about that. The other thing, though, is that one of the hardest things to get to your point about um, a lot of things coming back to tricky linguistic problems. I was just tweeting about this the other day, and I genuinely don't have an answer for it. We somehow have to be able to talk about groups and entities acting. Like we have to be able to attach verbs to nouns, even as we know that on some level distorts the situation. So like when you say like the Republican party like chose a strategy like this, like did they choose it exactly? Well, like like going back, you know, go back to the Civil Rights Act itself, you know, like the, the, big, the big play here. Um, Lyndon Johnson, breaks with many of these Southern Democrats to push the Civil Rights Act. Simultaneously, uh, Everett um, Dirksen, uh, Everett Dirksen, right, I think it is? Dirksen is his last name one way or the other. Dirksen, the Republican Senate minority leader, breaks with many conservative Republicans to back the Civil Rights Act. Democrats are the majority party in Congress during this period, like in, in, big time. But a higher proportion of Republicans vote for the Civil Rights Act than Democrats. And then Lyndon Johnson signs it over the filibuster of Southern Senate Democrats. So I bring all this up to say, who did the Civil Rights Act? Was that a Democratic bill? Was it a Republican bill? But what happens during this time is Barry Goldwater runs, becomes a Republican uh, nominee and runs against the Civil Rights Act. So it's Barry Goldwater and what flows from him that comes to define the Republican party and also like create the beginning of like, the Republican party was against the, but many Republicans weren't. And for a long time, the Democratic party was still very racist and you know, somewhat argue still is today in certain respects. And so I feel this all the time when we talk about these things. It's not that nobody is making a decision, but at the same time, decisions are not really being made. Like when we talk on Twitter or in politics about the left doing something, there is no such thing as the left. But also there definitely is such a thing as the left, but they don't have a meeting and nobody makes a decision. And sometimes the thing we're saying the left is doing is also not like representative of like what the left thinks. Same is true on the right, same is true of the Democratic Party. We will blame the, you know, if the Democrats, it is simultaneously fair to say, Democrats failed to pass any voting rights bills in this Congress, but also almost every Democrat in Congress tried to pass a voting rights bill and it's just that two Democrats wouldn't give it an exemption from the filibuster. So do Democrats, like, how do you, how do you describe what happened there? So I just think there's actually a really difficult problem and it imposes the way we talk, the way we talk about politics imposes an implicit logic and organization on it that it does not in fact possess. And so the truth is that in the past 15 years, most of like the actors of the Democratic Party have not wanted the Democratic Party to be as aggressively pro like social justice and woke as it has become, at least in public perception. And Republicans did not want the Republican Party, Republican elites to become what Trump made it. They fought him, they just lost. And so there's this weird way in which the outcomes here don't really reflect don't really reflect strategic decisions. They reflect complex processes, internal fights, schisms, cohesion, um, confusion, mis misrepresentation in the media of what people are doing. It, it's just it's really weird because like I have to tell a story about politics where you can understand what's going on, but also to tell that story imposes a tremendous amount of violence on the complexity of what is and isn't happening. So one way to think about that is to go back to this idea of that there's an emergent order, right? And so what we're doing, it's like when we talk about the market, the market likes this, the market wants this, whatever, we can speak of that, it's an emergent order, there is no actor that is doing that, right? But if there is this emergent political order, and it's that emergent, because it was very surprising to me in, to learn in your book, the ways in which on the one hand, polarization is increasing, but the party power is decreasing. Um, yeah. That was surprised, right? Um, but this, what you're saying now kind of um, helps explain that which is that like it's like there's this force 
and that force is the demos, right? The people. Um, and there's a kind of order that emerges that isn't, you know, anyone's individual choice, but it is about, it is a function of, you know, people anticipating what other people will, um, how other people will react to what they do, right? That that creates like an order. And then we need some way of talking about that uh, and about that, th that entity, right? We talk about the market. Um, uh, and um, I mean, so maybe the, the, the question isn't sort of like um, what, um, you know, uh, like, is it okay to personify this thing or not? I mean, that's one question you could ask, but like the in a way, the deeper question is like, could this be true democracy? Like is true democracy, the idea that there is this order that emerges from the people that really isn't very controllable in a top-down way um, by like the main political actors. But which that people, it becomes a hard, hard question there. And, and is it a demos? I mean, certainly some people and somehow this is happening, but, but let me, let me complicate it further, right? Cause it'll just get weirder the further you go down. So Donald Trump launches an basically functionally an internal insurgency inside the Republican party. And the nature of that insurgency among other things, but I would say centrally in 2016 is the Republican party for some number of years now has been trying to become a more pro-immigration party and it has been held back by its own base. So in 2007, George W. Bush tries to pass an immigration reform bill. That bill dies due to a conservative revolt in the Senate. In 2013, there is a gang of 13 in the Senate. They try to pass an immigration reform bill. That bill dies due to a conservative revolt in the House. Um, during this period, there's like a lot of Republican ferment about how they need to become more pro-immigrant. I saw Phil Oliver on the side there says, no, the, there is organization. The right does have meetings as a GOP caucus. But like the Senate GOP caucus wanted to become more pro-immigrant. John Boehner and Paul Ryan believed that you should pass the immigration bill, but they couldn't get, like they, they would have faced too much backlash from the base, so they never brought it up for a vote. Um, which is to say that like there's organization and then there like it's a lot of competing, competing things happening internally. So Donald Trump launches this revolt, right? And he descends a golden staircase and he says, you know, when, when Mexico sends her people, they're not sending their best. And, you know, the immigrants are rapists and murderers and so forth. Okay. Then there's an election against Hillary Clinton, who is clearly a beatable candidate, it turns out. Like she's a lot weaker than a lot of people thought she would be. You know, there's a lot of dislike uh, in the electorate towards her. She, she has a very uphill climb. Now, Donald Trump facing this clearly beatable candidate loses the popular vote by 3 million votes. So in one world, like let's call it Earth One, where we do this crazy thing, where we give the election to the person who wins the most votes, Donald Trump loses. And Donald Trump and the Trumpist faction in the GOP are blamed for losing a clearly winnable election. And our Democrats have another term in the White House and they probably get to name the, the replacement for Scalia. And like all of politics has this hinge moment in this direction. And the Trump insurgency is considered to be a failed insurgency. And the Republican Party, as happened to the Democratic Party, after losing to Reagan, to Reagan, and then to H.W. Bush, moderates. Now, maybe that wouldn't have happened, but, but maybe it would. Instead, the Electoral College intercedes in a totally bizarre way. Donald Trump wins and takes over the Republican Party entirely. And now the Republican Party becomes a much more directly anti-immigrant vehicle than it would have been in, in the counterfactual. Which is all to say, what was the role of the demos in that? <laughs> Um, was the demos like the electoral college? Like what, you know, is it the counterfeit? Like I think Marco Rubio would have beat Hillary Clinton by four points. I think John Kasich possibly by more. So it's all just really weird is, is part of the problem. And some of it is very contingent. I do think there are places where, I was just having this conversation with somebody the other day, there's not an answer to the question of do politicians lead the public or does the public lead politicians? Sometimes politicians lead the public and sometimes the public forces politicians to go and, and, and forces leaders in certain directions. And it's back and forth and feedback loops and you know hard to model and, and the whole thing. But um, but you know, like sometimes you can get a party to change its mind on something. Uh, Donald Trump, I think, has done a lot to change Republican minds on trade. And sometimes you can't, like the consistent effort of conservative elites to create a pro-immigration party thinking they could be, you know, open on immigration and still cut taxes for rich people. So, you know, I would like to see it be more of a true democracy, but, um, but you know, and that's just like one layer of complexity. There's also primaries, which are super different. And so it's just, it's just really weird. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wasn't like in a way. I didn't want to. I, I, I sort of said that it would be a true democracy. I'm not sure it would be the best democracy. Um, sure. And it may be that 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 um, it's sort of like certain sentiments of people are more easily collected than others, right? And so um, the something could be in the you know the demos pushing very hard. It wouldn't follow that it was representative, right? Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it, like there, it, it did seem to me that there, there must've been, I, it was strange to me cause I didn't encounter them, but there just must've been this like large group of people who, you know, Trump really unified them, brought something out. Um, uh, so that, uh, And I mean, yeah, I don't know, like, I, that's not a view about which way it goes. Um, mm -hmm. Let me, we, we should move over to our question period. Tyler, if you can come up and call the first person up, but before we do that. Um, I'm gonna try uh, to switch my headphones real quick because I'm losing these. No problem. It might work without headphones too. You're, I think, muted. Oh, okay. We can't hear you. There's a little mute thing at the bottom that's so it suggests that you're muted. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So let me ask you my last. I have like, so many more questions, but I'll, I'll ask you this one. Maybe I'll squeeze some others in during the during the Q and A. Um, you you know uh, uh, you talk about identity politics being in some ways zero sum, and you had an interesting line in there about how debate about PC culture is really a debate about whose grievances get heard. Right. Um, and here's the question I have. Is the debate about whose grievances get heard? Um, hi, Andrew, we'll be with you in just a second. I'm just gonna ask this question and then we'll hear your question. Uh, uh, is that debate also zero sum? That is, 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 is it, like, could we somehow just hear more grievances or do we have to choose whose grievances we hear? Agenda control is a very powerful kind of control in American politics. So, I mean, on some level, you can hear a lot of grievances and we obviously do, but specifically what I'm saying in that section of the book is I do think a lot of the debates over, you know, what get called PC, like how come you're yelling at me about pronouns is a literal issue of, we don't want to hear your specific grievances. Like we were happy with a set mm -hmm. of political issues we had judged as real political issues before. And we are not interested in hearing that you're upset about police brutality and you're constantly being misgendered and want to use different bathrooms and you overhear, you know, um, you know, we don't like, we don't want to hear about microaggressions. Like, you know, we, we don't want to hear about how workplace culture is like anti-woman and, you know, men are a little bit overbearing that every time. And like, this is very consistent, I think throughout American, uh, American and all, kind of all political life, once the boundaries of acceptable politics are set, people don't really want to expand the bandwidth to issues that frustrate, divide, or change them. Um, or at least a lot of people don't. There's always going to be a backlash to that because the ability to set the agenda is a lot of power and the ability to say, you know, that we're going to expend energy on changing things so that they work better for me. Uh, I don't necessarily think it has to be zero sum. I think a lot of policy is positive sum, but I think that PC culture stuff feels very zero sum to a lot of people because they don't want to be told they have to change how they're doing things. Um, but it's not zero sum to the people who are coming into the system. Um, okay, great, thanks. All right, hi, Andrew, thanks for waiting. Uh, we can't hear you, I think you're muted. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties yeah. as well. Is it good now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I have a couple questions, but I think you, Ezra, you specifically requested ones that were not politics related. So I will ask the one related to uh, effective altruism. So I don't know if you consider yourself outside of effective altruism. Uh, I'm I'm very much inside of it. So I'd like to hear outside perspectives. Um, so regarding effective altruism, what do you think are the best criticisms of it? And what do you see as the future of its impact on philanthropy going forward? 
Uh, so I have a very long, if you're interested in a lot of thoughts on this 80,000 hours podcast, uh, very much about these issues, uh, which I enjoyed a lot. I would say I'm very heavily influenced by effective altruism. Whether or not I literally am one, I think is uh, I will let other people decide. I think my main critique of it would be that it too often allows itself to indulge in the illusion of empirics um, on two levels. So one, um, the place where it doesn't do an illusion here is that it has, I think, very, very usefully through Give All and Others pushed towards a focus on interventions we know work, right? That we can run the randomized control trial, you get the malarial bed net, you can you know, run that a hundred ways and it really does seem to help. There are all kinds of interventions that we cannot effectively run trials on. We just can't. Um, like say things to change the way state capacity works in poorer countries. It is very hard to run randomized you know, state capacity uh, trials um, or to change politics or whatever. So I think it shortchanges them almost by nature. But what's funny is then there's this other part, right? The long-termism part. And I'm a, I'm influenced by long-termism. I'm a fan of it. I'm blurbing uh, uh, Will McCaskill's coming book. But that works off of an almost a kind of mathematical blackmail, right? Where it's like, well, look, if you imagine, if you agree with my supposition that one day there could be 10 trillion human beings or 100 trillion human beings because of all the human beings who could possibly live as we expand throughout the galaxy subject only to the laws of physics, then anything that increases the possibility of that happening by 0.0000001% is worth more than saving the lives of every human being alive today, which I'm obviously exaggerating here a bit for effect, but, but not frankly that much. I'm not even saying that's wrong. I am just saying that the ability to run that calculation is subject to so much uncertainty. And then to think about how you might help that come into being is subject to so much uncertainty that the like the the mathing it up is just kind of bullshitty. Uh, I have a good, I think I my podcast with Holden Karnofsky, who I really, really like from Openfill is good on these issues. And so I think there's like a big middle. It underplays almost by definition because it prefers things you either can measure or you can model like, and the modeling has to be so tilted and the measurement so sure that like the fuzziness of human life, which is like how most change would happen and probably also how you do things that would affect the long term, is a little underplayed. The other thing I would say is that I think effective altruists uh, as a culture, and this is very much uh, in terms of also their kind of intersections with rationalists and others, I think they have, they, they put too much stock in what I would call like an aesthetic of rationality, which is separate from actually being rational. I think they are terrified of um, emotion in a weird way <laughs> and too often downgrade any kind of information that comes wrapped in emotional package, which is like fine for me. I'm very good at arguing under those terms, but a lot of very important things come to you wrapped in somebody who's literally hysterical because something terrible is happening to them or they're having some terrible experience. I'm not a huge fan, even though I, I sort of like it in theory of a lot of the like epistemic status of this one, 42%. I think a lot of that and like the fake probabilities, like Toby Ord's book, like it has like like probabilities he's picked out of the ether on different kinds of existential risks. That stuff makes you seem very credible without it actually referencing anything very real. Um, and so I worry sometimes that they put too much stock in it. It's like, it's great if you hold it super lightly, but I don't think they do. I think it's used as table stakes for being taken seriously in the conversation in a way that will wall off too many effective altruists or rationalists or whatever from uh, viable perspectives that they need to hear. But again, I'm mostly super pro um, effective altruism. I started, you know, like I raised the money and helped create Future Perfect. So you asked me for my criticisms, but I'm yeah, I'm, totally. I'm not a I'm not a critic first. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll give you uh, I'll give you Aristotle's criticism uh, of effective altruism. He never got to make it, but um, uh -huh. I feel like what he would have said. It's a really interesting fact that Aristotle considers like different kinds of good or happy life, like many different kinds of life of pleasure, life of philosophy, political. One life he doesn't consider is altruism as like even a possible good life, right? And I think the reason is because he would say, well, wait a minute, this is like, suppose we have a really extreme effect of altruists of the kind where they are, you know, just 
picking the job that like makes the most money so they can take all that money and send it to buy malaria nets right which is a i mean kind of caricature of but there are some people like this right mm -hmm. yeah there's people it, and strangers drowning yeah exactly right so i think aristotle would think that's just really really like he would say wow you guys ended slavery but then you got these other people just voluntarily enslave themselves right because that's what slavery is it's becoming a human tool for supplying the necessary conditions of life for other people right um that's his definition of what a slave is he would right? definitely get canceled for that view <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah slavery yeah. it's you know there was that's... slavery and now the effect of altruists also slaves uh, aristotle is problematic yeah so anyway that's that would be aristotle's point of view uh that it would be very very hard to actually live a good life that is yourself as an effective altruist though you might be doing lots of benefiting um uh, but yes, it's true that Aristotle will be canceled for a lot of things. I once wrote a New York <laughs> Times op-ed on why we should not cancel him anyway, even though he said so many cancel-worthy things. Um, and by the way, when you come on screen, okay, we might not talk to you immediately because we might still be answering the previous person's question. Um, but just stick around and we will get to your question. Um, and in the meanwhile, um, if we're having... Oh, okay. Here we go. Hi, guys. Oh, um, hi, Ruby. Hi. Make up some water while we talk. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, um, I was interested in, in fact, in both of your answers to this question, but I think it's a little effective altruist related. Um, Ezra, in particular, I was wondering if you were to time travel back to being an undergrad in 2022, how would you think about the life to lead um, in terms of having a joyful life, but also in terms of how one tackles the big problems like human and non-human suffering? What choices might you make? All right, so by so um, such a great question, but let me just make sure I heard the qu correct parameter. I'm an undergrad, but I'm in 2022. Yeah, you're me basically. I'm an I'm a fourth year at U Chicago studying in environmental studies. You're facing the world. Okay, how to? It's hard for me to answer because I my college experience was so important because I mostly ignored college and started a blog. And that ended up like putting me into journalism and, you know, now I'm a New York Times columnist and it all worked really well. But it was in many ways, I regret not having had more college experience, but I certainly wouldn't change it because I'm happy with how the, the path ended up. So I think on that level, I would probably not be. I think I probably have more respect for serendipity and I, I tend to have a lot of um, interest in people who find the thing that obsesses them and they pursue it. Now, if the thing that obsesses you is reducing aggregate suffering, then I would spend a lot of fucking time on EA forums, going to things like EA Global, um, trying to meet EA people, like emailing Scott Alexander, emailing the, the folks at Future Perfect like Kelsey Piper, and just doing everything I could to become, uh, you know, being on less wrong, writing super long, you know, things built around unusual thought experiments. <laughs> you know, I mean, if the point is you want to be in the, the sort of EA world, I actually think that's one of the ones where it has a, a pretty clear digital path to entry um, compared to a lot of other things. So the nice thing about college is that it often gives a lot of time to do that. Sorry. Oh, uh, but now you're muted. If one shares all of your critiques with EA and maybe finds EA forum conversations really, really frustrating because of all of those said critiques, I think my question is not just about reducing suffering, but more Got about okay. leading, leading the life one wants to lead, I guess. Um, it's a really, I, I'm pausing because I don't know that I have a great question, uh, uh, a great answer. I'm going to give one more shot at an answer, but I'm, I'm not confident in it. Because it also depends on your skills and aptitudes, right? There's no one path. There's a path of what you're good at and what you can kind of give give yourself over to. And I just don't know you well enough to know what it is. What I will say though, is I think people pretty badly underestimate uh, like the meta level of development that they have time to do in college. And I would think a lot about developing really good attentional and informational habits so that whatever you were doing over time, you had some like agential control over. Uh, I part particularly think like it's a good time to try to understand like how you absorb information, how you work with information and how you work with distraction. 
because if you're able to figure those things out and like be one of the people in the world who can like still spend a lot of time, you know, reading and absorbing books and so on, you're gonna have a huge leg up in whatever you do. Uh, and it takes time. It's really hard to do that when there's a million things like tugging on your attention. So I kind of think of, and this speaks to my own college experience, I kind of think of college to some degree as being unusually cosseted space to be able to work on who you are and what your hobbies are, because you can either invest a lot in college if that is aligned or sort of ignore college somewhat and like do okay, but you know, be, be really drilling into something um, if, if that's what you need. My feeling is that the, re the really, really big difference, there's a really big difference between being an undergrad today and an undergrad when I was an undergrad in like the late 90s. Um, I mean, there are many, but here's the biggest one. Um, somehow, um, we live in a world where people are ever more concerned with sending signals that have to travel ever further. So it's like, um, like the thing, Ezra, you said about like, you know, getting a leg up, like, that's a necessary sort of thought for people at an earlier stage of the game. Um, mm -hmm. People as undergrads are professionalizing themselves, you know, already much, much more so than my fellow students were, right? I was an undergrad at the same place where I'm teaching now. So I see a huge difference. Um, and um, what that means is that there is just this pressure, right? To like not be in the moment <laughs> in any way, right? Um, but to be in a sense, packaging yourself. Uh, at so many levels, like a lot of them aren't even conscious, right? Um, but like, you know, it, it, an under, undergrad version of me as a first, second year student would be thinking, what professors might I be able to get to write me a letter of recommendation in case I want to go to grad school? I hadn't heard of grad school until my junior year. Of, I didn't know there was such a thing, right? There were grad students and I still didn't like put it together that like I could keep going to school, right? Uh, my parents didn't go to school in this country, so it was not... Uh, so, but like that, people are, people are, they've wised up to the system in, you know, and that's, um, uh, it's ha it creates a ton of stress and a ton of conformity pressure um, um, because people are like cultivating their, uh, uh, the, the image that they will present to, I don't know, tenure committees or something or employers or whatever at like a really early stage of the game. That's just this huge, I would say it's a huge difference. That's the number one difference that I would see. And I don't know how I would have dealt with it or what advice I would have given myself. I mean, I, I give people advice on this question all the time, constantly, but it's very concrete, very specific scenarios. Also, fuck off some. It gets harder <laughs> to fuck off as you get older. I, I, I should have fucked up more in college. I don't know. <laughs> I was super, super serious in college and I had more fun in grad school. But I don't, I don't regret not having more fun in college. Like I liked college, um, but I was really, uh, I just like, I studied all the time, uh, but I kind of like yeah. that. So, um, um, okay. I think we're, um, Jordan, we're waiting for you. Um, and if you can't come up, um, <laughs> yes, that's true. Ruby. I have given you a on this question. My camera actually oh, isn't I working, but I can speak if that's all good. No problem. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I noticed at the beginning we were talking about this idea that there are like kind of two camps of people uh, forming out of like the Republican and Democratic Party. And then we also talked about um, in the abortion discussion, this idea that like even empirical evidence won't necessarily change someone's opinion. Um, and so I was wondering, how do someone's political views change? Uh, like, what do you think changes people's political views? And like, when are the cases when this happens? It is extremely hard to change people's political views is the the, the broad um, answer of that literature. I used to joke that you can absolutely change somebody's mind, but that what it requires is something like if you're trying to change a Republican's mind, like you have to get them alone and then they have to do MDMA with Colin Powell and then like really bond. And then at the end of that, maybe you can convince them to. Um, I think the biggest thing we see in terms of people's mind changing is pure effects. The likeliest thing that will make you change your mind is that people around you and like you have changed theirs, and it is becoming socially weirder for you to not do so. That will not. That is also not like a surefire thing. A lot of people don't change their minds under that circumstance either, or they find a new peer group. Right? You can also exit. Um, but you know, if you look at things where a lot of minds changed 
together. Um, things like, you know, opinions on gay marriage say they seem to have this dynamic and we, we see it on, on, on small scales too. I mean, just really weird ideas will sweep through groups really quickly. And all of a sudden, a lot of people who know each other all at once will believe something crazy or not crazy, but something new. So to a first approximation, we believe what the people around us and who we want to think well of us believe. So there actually has been, for instance, a genuinely huge amount of democratic attitudinal change on issues of race because other people who are liberal Democrats have changed really dramatically on issues of race and it has become like very uncomfortable to be a racially conservative Democrat. And so those people have either left the party or become in many cases much more racially liberal. Persuasion doesn't really work that well, though. Um, there's really not a lot of evidence you can argue somebody into a new position. Uh, to the extent you can, it's relational. It's they have to feel really safe with you. And then eventually, over time, they might begin to change their views, you know, and, and you become an outlet with which they do so. But the idea that you can, like, walk into a situation and, like, there's some playbook for changing their mind on something where they already have their mind relatively made up, it typically doesn't work. I don't have any views on this question. I've never tried to change someone's mind politically. So, and I've, I've failed at changing my own mind. Um, David, Jesus Christ, did somebody ask there if Lincoln should have given up the South because of groups think a particular, sorry, I don't wanna, it's full of go ahead. slaves. Go ahead, answer. Like it's bad. Like, <laughs> I mean, if, if it was just a totally normal secession question, I know that the Civil War was not like in Lincoln's mind just about slavery, but that was a big part of it. Um, I think people sometimes are a little bit too blase about um, about you know they, they're 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 mapping current secession onto past secession, but uh, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't just let the South continue on as a slave society. That would have been bad. David, uh, hi, 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 Ezra. Um, I'm a huge fan. I listen to your podcast like every Tuesday and Friday. So, <laughs> um, I, I have a kind of really difficult question. Um, and part of the problem with democracy is that we, that for the people that are really into democracy and want it to continue thriving, is that we also have to sort of simultaneously include the people that don't want democracy. Um, and it sort of goes along with the problems of free speech, right? We want everybody to be able to speak, but we also have problems of people that are using that free speech to just destroy our, our country and the sort of solidarity that would allow us to all exist together. So I guess my question is like, what what do you see as one of the best ways to um, combat that kind of really toxic speech that still allows us to hold to these values of free speech at the same time? So it's a good question and obviously a hard one, right? This is, I think, called the paradox of tolerance that to truly be tolerant, you also have to be, you ultimately end up being tolerant of people who are, want to be intolerant of you. I don't, so a couple things. I, I first would not say I see the protection of democracy as first and foremost, or even primarily a speech problem. I don't think what is particularly dangerous to democracy is speech. Um, and I don't think the, it would help a lot to like suppress you know, a speech about the idea that, you know, they people think Donald Trump won the 2020 election or something. I don't think that would be effective. I also don't think it's where anything is really coming from. Um, I think it is worth admitting when you talk about American democracy that we've always been a country, like many countries, but we've long been a country with a very large anti-democratic element in it. That element was militarily defeated to some degree in the Civil War, did not go away. It then has mounted many, many different comebacks, but it's not only in the South either. Like what, how much of a democracy America should be and who that democracy should be for were unsettled questions at our founding, unsettled questions in the Civil War, unsettled questions at the New Deal, unsettled questions at the Great Society, and they are somewhat unsettled today. And I think, you know, over time, they've been going, you know, mostly in the right direction with some reversion. But... I think the best thing to do is to win elections. Like it's not the answer people exactly want, but I think that the people who want a reasonable democracy in this country, you know, rather outnumber the people who don't. 
And I think the issue is, though, you have to then, recognizing that a lot of people do not abstractly care about democracy, you're going to have to appeal to them on things they do care about. So people can be attached to a democratic process in a bunch of different ways. And something I often tell people like in practical politics about democracy is that the biggest danger, in my view, to democracy's continued functioning and survival in America is not that people don't believe in it, but that it doesn't deliver. A country that does not deliver for people is going to create fertile ground for populist outsiders and authoritarians. A political system that cannot adapt is going to become over time weaker and weaker and weaker. So a lot of my interest in making the political system operate to some degree more effectively and more small d democratically is also to create a tighter feedback loop between what people want from politics and what they get, and then their ability to judge what they get and then course correct. Uh, I think if they did that, democracy would be stronger um, without having to, to worry particularly about people's speech. You know, I don't give a shit about democracy, but I like the fact that I get good cheap health insurance. It's a perfectly good reason to be part of a political system, but I'm super pissed off because it feels like nobody cares about me or my problems. And here's this guy who doesn't care about democracy, but seems to care about me and seems to like believe I should be raised up in status. That's something where people can, you know, defect from a democracy. But in both cases, I don't think their abstract view about democracy is all that relevant. One thought I have about this that's a lot less con concrete than Ezra's thought is that it's interesting to me that we have sort of three categories of speech. One is speech that's worth engaging with, even if it's wrong, um, um, but like, we're gonna listen to, we're gonna try to argue, we're gonna try to persuade, you might be persuaded, we think we have something to learn, okay? That's at the one extreme. The other extreme, very far extreme, is like speech that is just troublemaking in a in an, a kind of, like cr shouting fire in a crowd around time or something. And no one's like, oh, we should free speech. It's just like, look, so, like, it's like a kid. Sometimes they're just misbehaving, you're just like, stop it, right? So there's, there's kind of misbehavior speech, right? Where there's not even really any content to it. But then the weird thing about politics is that there's this third category, which is people saying stuff that you think is too dumb to take seriously, but you gotta let them say it. Um, it's not quite misbehavior, right? And it's like, um, how do we, you know, how do we fit people into this, like, uh, let them talk, but ignore them category. And it's interesting to me that in other contexts of life, like in, in philosophy and families and whatever, there isn't that category of, the speech that you have to tolerate in the sense of let people do it, but you can ignore it, right? And I think like a lot of the, like for me, if somebody were treating me that way, I'd just be really offended. I'd be like, why aren't you listening to me? Like, not just let me talk, but listen, right? I have something to say. And so, you know, that's for me, part of the paradox of tolerance is to what's tolerance, right? Tolerance a lot yeah. of the time means that second category where the, of the people we don't have to listen to, but we just gotta let them talk. So the Cory Booker line, he always says that toleration is an incredibly thin emotion to extend to your fellow citizens. Yeah, it's like, go ahead, I don't care. <laughs> hey, Steve. Hi, how are you? Thanks for the great discussion. Uh, this has probably have been covered already, but I just wanted to link the three concepts, uh, the uh, decline in religion in America and uh, the increased polarization and the less uh, compromise. And I kind of want to circle it around to uh, the Civil War analogy where folks may say, oh, polarization is a horrible thing. But of course, uh, <laughs> during the time of the Civil War, as, as Ezra just uh, pointed out, uh, that polarization was, was good in that even though it resulted in a horrific war, uh, it, we ended up getting rid of the, the moral scourge of slavery. Uh, so I, I think what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, compromise sometimes is not a good thing, uh, especially if you're dealing with political principles that are f grounded in morality and, and that the decline in religion, uh, I think, has created polarization about issues that are kind of religious in nature because maybe the, the political parties are now the new religion. Um, the thing I'll add to that is simply to say that I often try to tell people that an alternative to polarization is not like consensus, but suppression. That as a very simple model of a polarized versus non-polarized system, the non-polarized system doesn't not have disagreement. 
But because much of the disagreement is internal to political parties, the political parties have an incentive to suppress the disagreement because it is unhelpful for them. And so like trade and immigration issues were to some degree, particularly trade issues were suppressed in both parties because they split their internal bases. But that meant that like the anti-trade side really didn't get a hearing and became more and more frustrated to, to Agnes's point about toleration. Um, race in American life for a very long time was suppressed as a political issue because it split the internal coalition. So the, the Dixiecrats who controlled a lot of house committees and had power over the filibuster use that power to bottle up civil rights bills and make sure they never got to the floor and never got a real hearing. Um, anyway, uh, oftentimes like you can, like it's I always think useful, people often think of polarization as some kind of synonym for disagreement, but it is not a synonym for disagreement. It is a way disagreement can or cannot be structured. When disagreement is not structured that way, that disagreement is often suppressed. What do you, Ezra, what do you think about the idea that politics somehow has a religious character or do you, does it seem to you to have a more religious character? Does polarization make it have a more religious character? I never know, really know what to think about, Glenn. I'm not a huge fan of this idea. Um, I don't really, I don't really, uh, this is no criticism of the, of the questioner. Um, I don't really know what people think they're saying when they're saying that. I specifically hear it a lot about like wokeness is the new religion, right? Yeah. That's like the big, that's a big line. I mean, in the sense it has a, like it's a ideology with a moral dimension, like what makes religions really, sometimes people act as if we just invented factions in 2017 or something. <laughs> I don't know why, like American history and all of global history is full of people literally killing each other for all kinds of different reasons. Some of those reasons are religious, some of them are political, some of them reflect parties, some of them are geographic, some of them are interest-based. You know, they're like, you know, it, it just, I think this thing that people are saying, like pol politics is a new religion is like quite bizarre. And I think one way you kind of know it's sort of bizarre is that somehow there's no difference in terms of um, how attached the highly religious and the highly secular are to politics. Like you might think, if what you're saying, like the prediction your hypothesis is offering, is that as people lose their religion, they'll become highly political. But evangelical Christians are highly religious and super highly political, as are many other highly religious people. And so if all you're saying is that politics is like an intense kind of group conflict dynamic, you might join irrespective of your religion. I, I just, I, I think it's, I think it's sort of a meme more than, it is doing a whole lot of like heavy explanatory lifting. I would like to know what the prediction being made by this point is and like whether or not it's borne out in, in, in data. I think people are just mm -hmm. saying they don't like that everybody else seems so like strident about their political beliefs. I haven't thought about this, but maybe we'll get back to it. I wanna hear Rich's question. Hi, Rich. Hi, how you doing? Thank Hi. you for the great, uh, the great discussion. I mean, my question, um, it seems simple enough, but it's politically intractable. Um, when I look at, uh, polit at po political parties, not part of the Constitution, yet they're probably the most polit politically powerful organizations in the country today. And so my question is, since, since what they argue for it, um, is for specific programs and, and things like that, they're lobbying organizations. So my, my utopia might be to have political parties register as lobbying organizations and then the way that Congress, uh, the government could operate is, is with caucuses, but with caucuses by interest areas. So you'd have an urban area caucus, you have a, 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 you know, an agrarian caucus, caucus, you can have a healthcare caucus. And you know, does, does that make any sense even though it might never be implementable? Um, I don't think it makes a ton of sense to me, but I may not understand the idea. But um, I don't think, so the practical effect of having political parties register as lobbying organizations would be to impose on them, like as a matter of law, different disclosure requirements and limits around financial contributions. But political parties are more regulated and more transparent around their financial contributions than lobbying organizations are already. Um, 
you can give an unlimited amount of money to a lobbying organization, but you can only give, I forget what the actual number is, but it's like 5,400 bucks to a political party. Um, so I don't think that would do anything. Then I think you're making another jump that maybe if you did that, they would be sort of relegated down to a level of like just another interest group and you could fracture them into more factions. Um, for a bunch of reasons related to political competition, I don't think it would work out that way. We have those factions in, in Congress now. There are a lot of different caucuses. They just don't have, nobody cares. Like that, that it doesn't really organize people's behavior because it's not their primary need. I think where you want to go with this though, I think the, the, the intuition you're getting at is that you want a lot more points of agenda represented within the negotiation. And there is a strong argument that polarization would be mediated and made more constructive by a highly multi-party system, such that it was it made more sense to form more parties that represented more distinctive interest groups. It's not like that that is now contained within the two parties. The two parties are these massive multi-coalitional structures. But in another world, you can imagine an ever Trump party, you can imagine a social democrats party, you can imagine like a sort of like Joe Manchin party, you can imagine, you know, there are all these, you know, all the factions you have in the parties now, the caucuses, progressives and new Democrats and Main Street Republicans and so on could be their own party. You would need to change the electoral system for that. Um, I 100% support, support all that. I think we should have a multi-party system. Um, I talk a bit about it in my book, but a book you might really enjoy on this is called Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop by um, Lee uh, Drutman. And it's very, very, very good. And I think would get it some of the bargaining dynamics you're, you're interested in here. I, I'm surprised to hear you say that we should have the multi-party system. I take it that would cut down on polarization, which you see as natural in some way, right? So can you just say another sentence on that? And then- uh, Yeah, we'll I, the see, I see differentiation, uh, party differentiation is natural. So if you have mm -hmm. a system that creates two parties, that is naturally going to create polarization because the only differentiation is like, like that, right? If you have seven parties, well, you might not actually have polarization. You might have fracturing. You might have a lot of different issue spaces represented within like the bargaining board, but it wouldn't necessarily be polarized. But again, I, I want to keep noting that I don't think a polarization is intrinsically bad. I don't think differentiation is intrinsically bad. I just think it would be healthier to have um, more, uh, like, more, more kinds of negotiating functions. You can have more kinds of coalitions as opposed to collapsing everything into a two-party dynamic. But I don't think that, like, I, if anything, I think that would allow for more differentiation than we currently have, which would be, which would be good without it turning into like just like two two mega like two mega organizations which collapses down a lot of distinctions it might be healthy to air out hi hi laura thanks for waiting hi um thanks so much for taking my question i'm a huge fan of your show um thank you so uh i was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on the work that you do um i was talking with a, another listener of your show and we were you know just thinking about the fact that i think you're you're doing something more than just uh conveying information or entertaining the viewer um you're kind of making sense of things uh, in a way that resonates with our identities and worldviews at least that's the theory that i've um developed of your show in part based on logics from your book and stuff um <laughs> but i was wondering if you could kind of say a bit about um your show like what's your theory of the ezra klein show what does it do um what role does it play in american political discourse Ooh, I will, I, you could probably imagine I have a lot of thoughts on this and you, you all probably don't have the time for them. I think that what I'm trying to do on the show first, in, compared to my role as a writer, I don't see the show as primarily offering information. I think of the show as holding a space for a certain kind of inquiry and then both creating the space for and perhaps like modeling a certain kind of discussion and exploration. Um, and there's like a lot of questions in about what you put into the show, right? How much of it is political and how much of it is not. And I have a lot of views about like why we, like why I've tried to move it a little bit beyond politics. But um, compared to say that like in the column, right? In my column for the Times or when I was at Vox, you start that column somewhere and my point is to get you somewhere else at the end of it. Like I'm taking you somewhere and I'm hoping you agree with me. And even though, as you've heard, I fundamentally don't have faith in persuasion, uh, 
it, it really is about like arranging information in a way to like try to convey to you my conclusion and try to make that conclusion persuasive. And the podcast just isn't that way really at all. It's just an open-ended inquiry in a space where maybe people can feel open to that because I'm open to it and I've held a space for the guests to be open to it. One thing I believe about podcasts is that people underestimate how much they are an emotional medium, but they extremely, like with a very, very, very high level, I think of, of fidelity, convey the emotion, the vibe happening in a conversation. And so to some degree, the most important thing in a show is what it feels like to listen to, which is totally orthogonal to what's happening in the show informationally. Um, now, different shows I think of mine feel a little bit different to listen to. Like, I think we have some some range, but uh, a lot of my thinking about the show is actually like taking place on like that level. Like, what does it feel like? What kind of space is this in politics? So how does it feel to come here for inquiry? Some of the genesis of the show is feeling that the spaces I had inhabited had become very toxic and wanting to create something that felt different. Um, some of the reason I've expanded the show as much as I have is feeling like politics has become cramped and is missing sort of the Agnes Callard, uh, among others, like set of questions about like, why are we doing this? Like, what does it mean to be here trying to live a life? Like, what is politics part of? What is the context for it? Um, but then, yeah, I mean, some of it is just wanting, like, I don't really believe persuasion works argumentatively but to the extent it ever works, to the extent people can be changed, I think it starts from being in a relationship and being in a space where it feels like everybody in it is open. People know if you're listening to them before they decide if they're listening to you. And so, you know, I want to create a space that has like a little bit more openness. Um, but I don't really expect the show to change people's minds. I expect the way that it works on people is sort of like by accretion over time. Like no one show like is about like, now you're now you know you know but over time i think it has a kind of effect in aggregate but i'd be a little bit hard pressed to say what i think that effect is maybe i can ask you a question ezra about the other part not the show um about mm -hmm. your writing and there's something i i didn't i really struggled to put my finger on like this question that i wanted to ask you there's a style that I think some of the best um, sort of political and um, you know public journalism type writing has, and you have it, and and Matt Iglesias and Ross Dowd had, and Zainab, and like a lot of people, and this it's like very very reasonable. Um, it's like this. Look, this is what you would think too if you thought about it as much as I did, and you had as much information as I did. It's kind of like the reasonable person is talking to you, and it's almost as though that's just become the default style. And there is no sense of there being some alternative, but like, I actually feel like, well, there's a lot of other, like, okay, these are, these are the best people, right? Um, and there's, there's sort of craziness all over the place, but it strikes me as just odd. Like it's odd that what there isn't so much of is like, here's a point of view you don't have. I'm just gonna spell it out for you. Um, or, um, or something like where the flavor of the person who's giving the view is really comes out, right? Uh, where it's like, this is clearly so-and-so's view and it's not even supposed to be my, so so there's something, there's something about um, this kind of ethos of reasonableness um, that uh, is is kind of has taken over the best journalism. And I, I don't know, I just wonder if you have any thoughts about it. It's a very vague question. I think there's something to it, although I think that you're selecting into it. Uh, would be my would be my initial thought and that mm. it's just kind of that you think those people are the best right a lot of people hate me ross matt and zainab is sort of doing something different i would say um i, I see zainab is much more um like expertise driven actually you know where ross and and, and matt and i are, are generalists who kind of range thing to thing i mean i have my specialties and, and so do they but but not the way zainab has over the past you know a couple of years of the coronavirus but you know, I think if you like think about who other big political writers and voices are, you know, you quickly come up with you know, and and I am making no judge. Like a lot of people, I really like, like Adam Serwer writes from a more moral perspective than than I do a lot of the time, you know, or Ta Nehisi Coates does, um, or uh, you know, Matt Taibbi or Glenn Greenwald 
are like much more like slashing in the right. They're like they're there's still I think a pretty deep well of polemicists out there if you're if you're mm. looking for them. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of sort of like right wing commentary is pretty intense at the moment. I mean, if you go to radio and, and podcasting too, you'll see that. Uh, so I think that um, even at the times, I think there are probably pretty big differences between how some of us write, although not unbelievably huge. I think the times sort of likes of certain cool, reasonable, but but even within that, you can you know find people who are who are more on one side of the spectrum than the other. But I think you like it. Um, and so, you know, I think that you're you're seeing that as a more dominant ethos, whereas kind of like I would describe like Ross's tone, tonal control as like a really distinctive feature of his writing that very few other people are able to do or match, you know, mm -hmm. and Matt to me is much more of like a brain and a that wonk. I don't think he has a highly reasonable tonal control, particularly not on Twitter. But um, but in his in his writing specifically, I think Matt's just unbelievable brilliance shines through, and you know whatever I'm I'm not going to characterize my own writing, but even to me like they're a little bit different from each other, and they're definitely different from a lot of other people out there. Like Andrew Sullivan does not write as like the most reasonable guy in the room. He writes as a passionate, eloquent, like moral voice for his ideas. And so anyway, I think there's a lot out there, which is good. There should be a lot out there. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for waiting. Oh yeah, no, it's it's great to be here. Um, I'm often a very passive listener of podcasts. I'll be like watering my plants or doing the dishes or something. And I, the podcast, Agnes, where you came on with us or Klein and the meritocracy, I, I stopped my in my tracks and I was like <laughs> taking notes. It was just like so fascinating. <laughs> um, it's such a great conversation, and I've thought about aspiration a lot since and this agency of becoming. And I, I've wondered just like how do you aspire or how do we work. Can you aspire at the scale of a nation state and as citizens, can we collectively aspire together and do we use the same strategies? Um, and if so, like what are the habits? What's the formation? Like how do we begin to like not just deal with the symptoms and talk about but go to the root causes and um I think that I've 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 tried to think about that. I've like tried and failed to think about group aspiration. Uh it's a super hard problem. And I think part of Here's why. Um, when an individual aspires, they do so by um, sort of being okay with the fact that they don't know what they're doing, right? So aspirants are pretentious in the kind of literal sense that they're pretending to an, an identity, a value, a way of being that they don't yet quite have, right? Um, and, uh, and so that kind of uncertainty, that kind of not having your footing, right, has to be a possibility for you as an aspirant. But um, at the group level, so much about group identity is about um, a, a kind of um, firmness and certainty about belonging to the group, right? Um, and a kind of fixing what the group means so that you can be able to affix that you belong to it. And so if the group itself is in transition, that very transition is um, is, is, is dangerous to the group in terms of it falling apart, right? Whereas you as an individual have much less because you're physically united in one body, right? So that's a really um, good like source of personal identity as much as philosophers will say, well, bodily unity can't be personal identity. It's like, that's, that's what we go on a lot of the time, right? But what is group identity? Um, and if you think about not just what is group identity, but what is group identity in the age when um, many important, identities don't have a really geographic um, constraint, right? So if people are, like if I identify with women, right? With all women, you know, that's really spread out, right? Um, and those are the sorts of identities that have become stronger through like the internet and all of that. So these are identities that are in a way fragile because they're like, they're not held together geographically. They're, they're, not, they're not physically one, right? They're nothing like a body, right? And so, the force that's required for holding the group together, I think is like a counter force to um, aspiration um, because it makes change really hard. Uh, and I have not come up with any solution to that problem. Do you think religions are a counter example there? You mean because they change over time? I don't mean because they change over time. I mean because that in a certain way that the force that at least 
conceptually holds them together is a kind of moral striving. Yeah, I mean, I have thought about this, like, um, like, like maybe in some way, um, you know, it, it might vary based on the religion too, where like Judaism um, is, is a religion of kinship and group identity much more than a religion of ideology. Um, like my, my son had his bar mitzvah this year and he had this speech for his bar mitzvah about like how you have to use reason to decide everything. And like, you know, and the, and the rabbi at some point was like, okay, but you they have, we had to put some religion in here, <laughs> but still it was incredible. <laughs> this is an Orthodox rabbi, right? It's incredible how much tolerance there was for, and how much tolerance there is in Judaism for like, does God exist? We don't know, right? So there it's mm -hmm. like the group structure through, you know, through inheritance um, frees up the intellectual material a lot, right? Um, there's going to be less of that when what it is to belong to the group is to believe one of a set of propositions, right? Then you just, you got to believe those in order to belong to the group. So, um, uh, and I mean, there are just in, in, in the religions that I've had an encounter with, there are just very, very strong forces of, um, you know, preserving the tradition um, as part of what it is for the religion to keep existing. Um um, Tyler, shall we just ask? Oh, no, we have someone coming. Okay. Hi, Chris. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I, I sort of have a question about questions uh, for both of you. Uh, to me, so many issues around human interaction come down to some foundational frame question that people don't tend to realize is underlying the dispute. So I wonder what you think are those big fundamental sort of questions, like, like one such question I was thinking of that was kind of already covered, but but it, it might be like, how much do we need to agree with each other and find common ground versus versus you know how much should we create separate spaces, separate value systems, separate informational sources that might relate to you know educational curriculums or journalism. But another one might be like you know how much bad are we willing to accept for some good, which might relate to social media. And then the last one might be how much information should you require to warrant an action or a belief, which might relate to climate action or vaccines or disinformation. So I don't, I mean, I, I think these don't have any answers, of course, but I wonder what you think of the premise and what these big through line questions that, that you might see at play today. I think it's a really sense. interesting question. Yeah, it does make sense to me. Um, I think you're right that uh, we often are not articulating what our question actually is. But at the same time, I think it's important not to pretend that if we could, we could answer it. And, and Chris kind of said that there at the end, but I, I do think some of it, you know, how much bad should we accept, you know, for some good, like being the social media question, I think in some ways it's an understood question. But first and foremost, people don't actually agree on what is bad and what is good in social media. And this is sort of what I mean that I think people really want politics to have like questions you can really answer, you know, questions that come down to a, like an objective empirical fact that can be weighted in the end and like, but you know, also different people just, even if they could like have a, like a holistic view of that, they would, they would have different views of it. Um, you know, social media means different things to different people. They use it in different ways. They want different things out of it. Um, Jair Bolsonaro's supporters, like really like what Facebook did for them. And they think Jair Bolsonaro is great and other people don't. Uh, but, I do think that the intuition there that we are often have pretending, we often don't really even know ourselves what we are arguing about is a really good one. And it is a very consistently frustrating thing in politics, but also in life, like also in marriages, also in friendships, also in, you know, when you're dealing with your toddler, why is my toddler actually upset? Um, is a really fundamental question that animates a lot of my life right now. And I really like, you know, like, and he doesn't even always know. And it takes a lot of uh, coaxing. Um, he wanted to leave his birthday party early the other day. And um, we were like, oh, well, he must just be tired. And, and then I was like, no, like, I need to stop and ask him, like, what is going on here? Why is he trying to leave his birthday party? He's three now. And it, I realized when I did, he actually gave me a really totally internally consistent answer. He's like, 
oh, basically, because you said this one present that somebody gave me, I can only open at home. So I want to go home and open the present. It's like, oh, no, like, then just fucking stay here and open these, like, <laughs> this million piece toy soldier present that you're forming. And like, you know, um, because you didn't want to go home. You want to, anyway. So knowing what you're actually talking about is good, but sometimes it's hard to know what that is. And sometimes we don't know it ourselves. I have to say that the um, the thing, the issue that I feel is like I'm reading into or seeing as looming behind this discussion of polarization and social media and uh, 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 identity politics. And this is probably because I'm teaching George Herbert Mead right now, who was a you know social founder of social psychology and who had this idea that like the self is selves, like a self is something mm -hmm. you only have in relation to other selves, right? Mm -hmm. And that an organism could negotiate its environment in ways that are beneficial to itself without <laughs> ever thinking of the things that it does as stimuli for the responses of something else, which is for, for me what it is to have a self, right? To have a self is to relate to another as a self. And so now you think, uh, well, hi, <laughs> we'll get to you. Uh, we'll get to you in one second. Um, uh, so now you think, okay, um, um, if you, if you only have a self in relation to other selves, right? That's that's what a self is. And then it's like a question that comes into my mind when reading me then when reading you is like, what is it like to feel that self, to experience that self? Like to, to really feel like it's there, which is to say, to really feel like you're someone, right? Um, now it's a social feeling. Feeling like someone is a social feeling, right? So mm -hmm. that, that it's possible to feel like a non-entity, like a nothing, like you literally don't have a self, right? And so like a lot of these super powerful political forces, I see what's behind them is the sort of quest for ourself where a lot like anger is one way that we can feel ourselves. Like when you, you, when you, when you relate to another in this, in this kind of anger relation, you it's, it's like a sensation of yourself, I think. Um, and so I'm sort of seeing this um, that's, that's the way I'm seeing the fundamental issue. Uh, and like, and maybe it's because I'm teaching me right now. I like that. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Jessica, not Daniel. But um, yeah. <laughs> I had a question that um, it actually goes way back to something that Ezra was saying about the Howard Dean um, commercial. So, I, you know, it's a little adjacent to what you guys have been talking about. So no problem if you don't want to um, spin it off. But um, I guess I was wondering when you um showed that commercial um I, I was just thinking about the kind of class ant antagonisms i guess is how i would put it that are present there um and I, one of the things i was thinking is like well is it that surprising that they showed that because in a way it kind of mobilizes these distinctions between you know maybe upper what you might call like more upper class or upper middle class taste and then um a kind of social class that it seems like the Democratic Party has really moved away from representing. Um, but yeah, so I just wondered what your thought about that was. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting and complicated one. This question, it's something that I end up circling a lot on the podcast of just what is class exactly now? Because to that point, that ad was run by the Club for Growth. It's like a, it's like a coffee clutch of billionaires. And the Club for Growth's entire purpose in life is to not allow tax increases on rich people or corporations. And the first thing they attacked Howard Dean for was tax hikes, which under the Howard Dean Fund would have been on rich people and corporations. So there's also something complicated here where it's like class is speaking, I think you're right. Like they are trying to suggest like, oh, these sneering cosmopolitan, uh, you know, coastal elites are looking down on you, eating their sushi and drinking their cool lattes. But also they're weaponizing that so Democrats can't raise money on super rich people who at that point, by the way, were much more public constituency, leading constituency than they are now. I tend to think that education is the best easy um, corollary of social class we have, even though it is still not perfect. I talked about this a little bit in this kind of big article I did on David Shore and populism and popularism in the Democratic Party about how like a Google executive like a, like a Google engineer and a um, owner of a pest extermination company in Houston probably look more like each other on income than the Google engineer and an adjunct English professor at Berkeley. 
but the Google engineer and the adjunct English professor share a lot more like class connection, probably know more of the same people, talk in the same way, vote for the same people, you know, read the same stuff on the internet. And so there's something going on there. It's not perfect, right? There's some there's some amount of conflict in American life right now between income and educational class. And we are not nearly as income polarized as we are polarized by other things. But it is a hundred percent like the it is just an amazing little window into the complexities of populism that, as you say, that's fundamentally a populist ad. But as I say, it is a populist ad paid for, crafted, and constructed by a group arguing for tax cuts for rich people and corporations. Can you just say? So. <laughs> can you just say one more? What What do you mean by we're not as polarized around? I think you said we're not as polarized around income, or is that what you said? Mm -hmm. can, can, sorry. Yeah. Can you if you just if you look at voting behavior, income is not as predictive in splitting us as as other things are. So if you look at different income tranches, like going up, you know, going up the income ladder, tranche to tranche, they look more similar. Um, so it's not like all the rich people are voting Republican and the poor people voting Democratic uh, in the way that education is now super Democratic predictive and, you know, lower education, less so. Um, or race is very predictive. Or like if I tell you if I tell you how much money I make, you do not have a good sense of who I vote for. If I tell you where I live, you do. If I tell like that's kind of the thing I'm saying about uh, about that that income is in some ways less party associated now than it has been at many other times in American politics, whereas things like education, race, geography, religion, supermarket you're at, etc., are, are more. Um, and so what that ad is trying to do is say that class is about drinking lattes, not about being somebody who would suffer under the Howard Dean tax hikes on the rich, and uh, like. A lot of other people in history would say, no, class is about having a lot of money, not drinking lattes and eating avocado toast. And, you know, class is a social construct and it is contested. I have to ask one last question before we uh, go over, yeah. over time. But um, it's just a thought that I had in connection with the wokeism as a religion. Um, forgetting about whether it's a religion, right? Um, you know, you might think that like if the, the democratic strategy, and again, there's no agent taking the strategy, but the democratic strategy is to have a heterogeneous loose affiliation, whereas the Republican strategy is to be more um, homogenous and unified and the Democrat has more, they've got more people, but the other side has like more homogeneity, then you might think that a problem that the Democrats are going to face more than the Republicans is like what unifies us and that you, you, there's more pressure to produce a unifying ideology, right? Um, and that wokeism could be that ideology um, and that there would have to be something. Um, it's a little bit like, right, Jews saying, look, it's just descendants, right? It's just bloodlines. And then you can think whatever you want, right? Versus like a conversion religion where it's like, you gotta, you gotta buy this ideology in order to be part of the group. So the, I, I think there's a lot to that. The the hitch is that, and you can poll this, and a lot of people have, wokeism, so to speak, is does not unify Democrats. It unifies Republicans. It is internally mm. cultural issues are internally controversial in the Democratic coalition. Economic issues unify Democrats and split Republicans. So Democrats almost universally believe in like you know more government provided health insurance, Medicare negotiating drug prices, raising taxes on rich people. Um, you know, the child tax credit, like blah, 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 blah. Um, but if you like start getting into things like pronouns or, um, you know, defund the police, you get a huge amount of internal controversy, which is why the Republican Party tries to make those central issues. Uh, conversely, Republicans are very, not, are very united on those issues. But if you pull Republicans on taxing the rich, they're super split. Um, health insurance is a, a very tough issue in the Republican coalition to some degree. Um, uh, there are a bunch of them like this. So the one of the takes on politics right now is that Democrats should want politics to be on economic issues. Republicans should want them to be on social and cultural issues. And the sort of confusing thing about politics right now uh, is that so much of the agenda is set by social media. And so like, if you look at what the Democratic Party tries to message as an agent, they try to message economics. 
But if you look at like what gets associated with liberalism, mm -hmm. it's like narratives burbling up from, you know, intense fights we have in the culture and on the internet, and they're much more cultural. Uh, so, you know, agenda control and who is actually acting really matter. So to your point about strategy, if the question is like a strategy for that coalition, the strategy is super clear and every Democrat um, in power knows what it is. The problem is they actually don't have control over the um, agenda space. And so like they want to talk about, you know, the childcare expansions and build back better plan. And they end up talking about, you know, something that is dominating, you know, dominating like the political debate, but it is not good for them. Um, so. Thanks. That's a great answer. Um, thank you so much, Ezra. Thank you for coming. Thank you all um, for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Tyler and William back there. Um, and everyone who came.